Fear is one of the most powerful human emotions. As such, humans have been seeking to harness it since the beginning of our species. Fear became a tool we used in stories to enforce our beliefs and teach moral lessons. This is evident from ancient folklore and myth to the horror films of today. Even horror without explicit lessons is enjoyed, as many find the rush of adrenaline that comes with tamed fear to be pleasurable. There is a great power in dictating fear, as it allows you to draw the line between the normal and abnormal, and influence large portions of society to see a certain thing or characteristic as inherently evil or dangerous. In an ableist society, it is inevitable that disability will be categorized as an evil, and that fear will be reflected in our horror movies. Examining the Black Stork, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and A Quiet Place will provide a timeline of the development of disability and horror, and maybe an answer as to how the genre can proceed and escape its ableist roots. Eugenics is the highly ableist belief that gene pools and the society as a whole can be improved by selective breeding and the destruction of quote-unquote inferior groups. These exact groups depend on who you ask, but eugenics has a notable history of attempting to eliminate inferior races and the disabled. Highly influential eugenicist Albert E. Wingman is quoted as saying, good-looking people are better morally on the average than ugly people. To the eugenicist, the elimination of the inferior group was morally correct and collectively beneficial. Eugenicists often advocated for the forced sterilization of these groups, but disability does not transfer the way race does. The child of an able and sane person can become disabled through any number of incidents or accidents. The question remained of what to do with these babies. Chicago surgeon Harry J. Heiselden had an answer. They should simply be left to die. He allowed at least six infants to die under his care for their disabilities in 1915 to 1918, sparking a nationwide controversy. He was also the writer and star of early horror film The Black Stork, an exploitation movie based on the real-life hate crimes he committed. Only four of the babies who fell victim to the violent and hateful ableism of High Selden could be identified in my research. John Bollinger, the unnamed daughter of Mr. and Mrs. William Meter, Emma Stank, and Grace Werder. It is unknown how many children Heisel did murder, or what they could have become had they not been robbed of their futures because of the innate prejudice and hatred baked into eugenics. The Black Stork was a propaganda piece, based specifically on the case of John Bollinger. It depicts a young couple who desires to marry, but the husband has relatives with disabilities and fears passing them on to his baby. There's an extended sequence taking place in Dr. Dickey's hospital, a character played by an emulating High Zeldin. Several scenes promote eugenic laws, which, in their own words, will prevent marriages amongst the unfit and safeguard humanity. The target audience of the Black Stork was the white, relatively wealthy, and Christian youth they sought to radicalize. The film had strong religious aspects, stating that it is God's will that these disabled children should be killed. Inherited disability is called the sin of forebearers in the Black Stork weaponizing the biblical concept of inherited and original sin. The only character of color in the film is a disabled black man, showed as an object of horror. Since white supremacist beliefs have often been linked with Christian nationalism, it is no surprise that eugenics would join in and capitalize off pre-existing prejudices. Despite the couple's concerns, they marry anyways, and soon the wife gives birth to a disabled baby. After the birth follows the long premonition sequence in which she sees her child grow up to be a criminal, often invading the personal space of high-class ladies this society sought to protect, stealing, causing fights, and inevitably killing the doctor that allowed him to live, believing he condemned him to this life of suffering. The premonition is said to be from God. The wife agrees with Dickie that God does not want the child to live and allows him to die. As he does, he jumps into the open arms of Jesus Christ, apparently ascending into heaven. The message of this film is explicit. Disabled children do not deserve to live, and disabled people should not be allowed to breed, lest they taint the fit population. Disability is nothing but the cause of crime and a great emotional turmoil to the cast of the film, and happiness is only found in the hero, Dicky killing the disabled baby before his reign of terror can begin. The film doubles in propaganda, helping to create an image of the inferior. Eugenicists didn't believe the average person could determine the inferior on their own, and thus they needed to be taught. According to Albert Wingman, 
Husbands and wives, and likewise their children, will be beautiful and intelligent if the ideals of beauty and intelligence are in the minds of our young people beforehand, so that they unconsciously reject the ugly and stupid, and find their happiness only in people that are lovely and of good report. And just as people whose aesthetic senses have been trained will unconsciously fill their houses with furnishings that appeal to the finer tastes, and articles of virtue that delight the spirits just as the ideals of the human body are properly trained. One of our earliest examples of a horror film sets a trend that would continue for decades, framing the absolutely useless subhuman monsters that terrorize the able and fit. The Nazis' rise to power can be blamed for the downfall of eugenics as a publicly held belief. Though these dots on disabled people were still held, being a direct supporter of eugenics was now shameful, as it was expressly condoned by Hitler and his allies. It would be decades before any real progress was made in the field of disability rights. By the 1970s, the disabled rights movement swept the country. It was even less acceptable now to say publicly the things people had once said about disability. Still, ableism lived on, even in those not directly promoting genocide. There was an innate terror in the abled mind at the sight of disabled bodies. The horror genre would continue to exploit this for revenue. Masahiro Mori argues in his essay, The Uncanny Valley, that humans feel fear and disgust for things that in their eyes fail to live up to a human standard. The valley is a metaphorical chart, with the affinity humans feel for the subject increasing the higher you go. He places objects such as the prosthetic hands at the bottom of the valley, as opposed to perceived healthy individuals at the top. Despite giving off the appearance of a biological hand, People sense the subtle differences between the forms of the hands, and thus their affinity for the disabled person decreases with the fear they have of imitation humans. The reason behind this phenomenon is still unknown. Some theorize that it comes from a place of natural instinct or fear of death, as imitation human bodies may serve as a reminder for conditions such as rigor mortis. Nevertheless, the uncanny valley has continued to have a negative effect on those lacking a quote-unquote normal body as we mentally distance them from humanity as a whole. Those working in the horror genre take advantage of the uncanny valley to construct their monsters, some creating complex or meaningful designs, and some making their monsters a mirror of disability. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is widely considered one of the greatest slasher films ever made. Released in 1974, it predates the golden age of slashers by four years and is credited with setting the stage for what defines a slasher film. A killer stalks a group of people, usually those in their teenage years to their early 20s, graphically murdering them with blades or sharp tools. Slasher films are deeply entwined with tropes such as the final girl. Chainsaw had all of this. It's no wonder it became iconic with the genre. Sadly, Chainsaw falls prey to another unfortunate trope in slashers, using disability to code evil. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre tells the story of Sally Hardesty, along with her brother Franklin and several of their friends going on a road trip through rural Texas. A series of mistakes leads Sally and the others to become targets of the Sawyer family, a group of impoverished cannibals. Mainly they are hunted by Bubba Sawyer, more commonly known by his family nickname Leatherface. Leatherface is explicitly disabled, a choice made specifically by the writers to make him terrifying to an abled audience. In Chainsaw Confidential, how he made the world's most notorious horror movie, the actor Gunnar Hansen, who played Leatherface, outlines the creative process behind his notorious character. Even in his most early conception, Leatherface was planned to be disabled. In fact, Leatherface was so retarded that he didn't really talk, though he did grunt and squeal like a pig at times. Could I squeal like a pig? I would learn, I said. Tobe added that Leatherface was insane in a way that made him unpredictable and extremely violent. All this made for a very dangerous man. Leatherface's behavior in the film is distinctly dehumanizing. He makes animalistic grunts and childlike noises of the light when catching prey. He is strangely animated, humming and giggling on occasion, moving in a bumbling, childish way. At the end of the film, he performs his famous dance, flailing his chainsaw in rage and spinning as Sally escapes the family. This fit-like reaction is reminiscent of stereotypes about the mentally disabled moving in a way that disturbs the abled. It is Leatherface's body that makes him terrifying to the audience. His sheer size and lack of intelligence are constructed into a threat of violence. His mask only serves to accentuate the terror of his body, 
as it takes the focus off whatever facial expressions he might have been making. Later in the film, he switches to a poorly painted mask of a lady in makeup, which is a sort of exaggeration to the features seen in children's drawings. Leatherface's character is an exaggerated caricature of the mentally disabled, as to an extent is his family. Nubbin Sawyer, his brother, is a facially scarred and impulsive man who helps his family terrorize the travelers. He is shown to be emotionally unstable, having violent reactions to imagined insults and moving in bizarre ways. He possesses similar childish manners to Leatherface, often teasing his victims and picking fights with his father. At Chainsaw's screening at the iconic Cannes Film Festival in 1957, the program notes declared about the villains. These are mentally retarded people, crazy people, people who we do not know ultimately if they're human or animal. A clear line is directly drawn between disability and evil. The exception to these people would be Sally's brother, Franklin, whom the film refers to as invalid. He is a wheelchair user, but like every other disabled character in Chainsaw, he is belittled for a perceived lack of intelligence. Sally's friends often tease her brother for his paranoia, and Sally herself is often exhausted from caring for him. He is set as an obstacle that slows the group down until he is suddenly murdered by Leatherface, leaving Sally the final girl. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre makes its disabled cast into monsters to terrify an abled audience. Sadly, this would become a common theme in slashers, with several other iconic villains having similar disabilities or disfigurements. Jason Voorhees of the Friday the 13th franchise is a mentally and physically disabled boy turned serial killer, and Freddy Krueger of the A Nightmare on Elm Street franchise is a severe burn victim. The slasher era was an iconic period in horror, but it was rife with ableism. The golden age of slashers ended in 1984, but its classic formula has remained influential in the genre. Art house horror films have seen a rise in popularity and controversy. Vulture magazine describes art house as tending to rely more on atmosphere and style to create an unnerving experience than actual scares. They may have characters or situations that lend themselves to typical horror narratives, but very often they work against the viewer's expectations by unfolding in elliptical ways, or keeping the actual horrors off screen, or sending their stories in new, surreal directions. Some call art house horror pretentious, or find insult in its attempt to portray itself as an intellectualized version of horror. Accusations of elitism are common. How has art house horror portrayed disability? The works of popular art house director Ari Aster have been exceedingly ableist despite the film's popularity and high ratings. His debut film, Hereditary, portrays the disabled character's condition as the result of a demonic possession, a message reminiscent of claims made by the black stork about God's hatred of the disabled. Astor's iconic cult horror, Midsommar, has another disabled and disfigured character, Reuben. However, Reuben's presence is used to unnerve the audience. He is the product of generations of inbreeding, like Leatherface, and according to Astor, he's more important as a symbol, as an idea, than he is even as a character. Reuben is denied his humanity as a disabled person in exchange for being a tool of terror. Acknowledging the current ableism in the horror scene is vital to improving, but that is not to say that all horror, art house or not, portrays its disabled characters as monsters. A Quiet Place is a prime example of how horror can do justice by its disabled audience and characters. In A Quiet Place, we follow the Abbott family, survivors in an apocalyptic world overrun by monsters that hunt by sound. They have survived so far because they have found ways to communicate without sound, as their daughter Reagan is deaf and they utilize sign language. Reagan is an icon of disability in modern horror for her deeply compelling storyline and ultimate victory. The audience is drawn to Reagan because she is not a caricature, but a fully rounded human. She is a rebellious and stubborn teenager, as any other teenager may be. She desires her freedom in this world, tired of being left behind by her hearing family when it comes to their exploits away from the farm to gather supplies and often finds herself at odds with her father, Lee. She believes Lee blames her for the death of their son, Bu, who was killed after Reagan gave him a toy that made a loud noise, alerting a nearby creature. The family dynamic is heavily explored in A Quiet Place, with Lee's final moments being spent signing to his daughter that he loves her. Their complex relationship is a relatable plot point for a wide audience, both humanizing and endearing us to Reagan. Reagan's deafness is ultimately what saves her family in A Quiet Place, 
Her cochlear implant has been broken for some time before the film started, yet Lee continues to try to repair it for her. The creatures have a bizarre sensitivity to electronics. When they approach Reagan, the humming her broken implant emit causes them pain. This serves to scare off creatures attacking the family and even allows Reagan's mother the opportunity to finish one off with a shotgun blast. A Quiet Place has a unique approach to disability not common in horror films, where is the saving grace of the cast rather than the damning faith or solely an obstacle, such as it was for Franklin in Chainsaw. More than that, Reagan's character is developed much further beyond the disabled one and flourishes on screen. A Quiet Place was extremely successful, receiving high praises and nominations for an Academy Award. Within its terror is an immense hope for horror as a genre and disability representation everywhere. Not only is fear a powerful emotion, it is as complicated as the humans that feel it. It is no wonder that a genre based upon exploiting fear would have the same complexities. Horror has a negative history of ableism. But to say that the history represents all it is and ever can be is a severe misnomer. Not unlike the final girls once worshipped by audiences worldwide. We fight on through the dark night into a better future for everyone who loves to partake in the ritual of terror.